implement democratic um, decisions, democratic decision making for water management. But this uh, river basin organization, for instance, in the Ebro River Basin, where I come from, have this model, this standard model for the terms of reference document, which includes the General Assembly, the Governing Board, the jury, because there has been a traditional emphasis on the legal aspects on the, these irrigated areas, the, how to manage infrastructure, construction, management, the geographic bounds of the of the irrigated area need to be uh, need to be described, and the nature of water sources and users, and then the disciplinary regime. Because then again, uh, this is a very typical century old um, feature of the irrigated areas. That has to be sanctions, because most of the governance is based on corrective actions, not preventive. Preventive governance actions are more typical for nowadays organizations. So there we have a tick on the to-do list, right? But the role and the functions of this executive board that I described are not today described in our terms of reference, meaning that this body is not foreseen. And we interpret that it's the farmers or the users themselves that implement their own decisions uh, through the irrigation guards or ditch riders, the personnel who is working on terrain. So this creates already a dysfunction. So as a consequence, in general, governing boards have a stand high probability of failure, right? Because, because these are people who are busy, who have other obligations, who are not retributed, or, very, or who receive very little compensation for their efforts, they do it out of responsibility. Some of these governing board members may find a way around to reach the cash <laughs> of the irrigated area, but in the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. by the way. So, uh, because there is little control, because governance is, in general, weak. Right? That's why we need professionals. That's why we need these professionals in the executive body, which will bring coherence and respect for the organization or organizational procedures of these irrigated areas. So, we need this uh, executive body because the liability of the governance is growing fast. Irrigated areas are being sued by the governments, by the users, and the irrigated areas need to demonstrate that they are operating according to standards. But these small irrigated areas cannot afford professional managers, and as a consequence, they are doomed. They will have typically very low performance. So here we have another problem. But we're talking about governance and about different ways of doing things. And uh, we are assuming that there are different models for irrigation governance, and there are plenty. The first of, all, the first of them that I want to discuss is the water uses associations. That's, that's where I feel more comfortable, because it's the, the model that I know best. But we, as I say, we, we wanted to generalize, so we are talking about irrigated areas, right? Water use associations, participative, self-organized, non-profit. Uh, and all farmers have the same rights, rights which are usually proportional to their uh, land tenure, right? But, uh, well, there are public administration can be ruling these irrigated areas. It's a common solution in many countries. Uh, and farmers organizations can do it also, uh, but the interface between the public and the pu private organizations has to be found somewhere between the main dam or the pumping station and the farmer, right? Typically, the government um, has negative traits in managing these irrigation organizations. Cooperatives have been used in, in different parts of the world, in Latin America, for instance, uh, very good results, not always good. Cooperatives are very good for, for, um, for instance, for uh, selling uh, agricultural uh, insumes to the farmers, products, seeds, fertilizers. 
So when, when a cooperative is running in the aggregated area, their focus will be on selling fertilizers. We have cooperatives in Spain with drip irrigation networks, and they have got a hold of the irrigated area because they sell their fertilizers through an injection pump. Mm -hmm. So it's very convenient for them. But it, it is usually not, not the best uh, option, right? Local entities, city halls, sometimes are are interested in managing the irrigated area uh, of their own municipality. Usually not a good idea, and we will see an example later on, because the boundaries of the irrigated area should accommodate changes in, uh, in, in um, the factors and the pressures. For instance, changes in the electricity bill, right? we may want to add an area to our irrigated, a certain area to our irrigated area because we can reach it with natural pressure. So it is not a good idea to have um, the, the borders of an irrigated area uh, locked by a municipality. Private companies, we have a couple of examples nowadays in Spain of private companies ruling irrigated areas usually because they have been uh, involved in build, operate, and transfer operations, right? So they stay. They stay for a while, forever, more forever than for a while, and, and they try to uh, collect a small compensation for their work. Now, when the economy was booming, they had no interest in doing so. It was more like hit and run, do this huge project, make profit, disappear. Now, with the crisis, they are more interested on having these small businesses here and there that sustain the organization. We're going back to the examples, and, and, and then, in this case, it's, it's Spain. Our irrigated areas, as I say, usually water uses association. I'm, I'm proud to say that the first river basin authority ever was created in in my city in, in some uh, 80, 90 years ago. And we have been switching from irrigators communities, which was the original name, to water user associations because there are plenty of different water uses already within the, these water uses associations. Our, our nature is public-private. It's, it's a complex institution. There are no civil servants in our water users associations. But the person who's holding the, the role of secretary of the Water User Association, he represents the River Basin Organization, and he is liable for keeping the public faith in the operation of the Water User Association. They're very often they are not aware of the responsibility, though. So um, these Water User Associations are an extension of the River Basin Organization. They are non-profit, which it's a problem often because sometimes they get plenty of money and <laughs> they cannot distribute their earnings. Uh, they cannot collect taxes under the Spanish law. Water is asked, uh, allocated to the farmers. Farmers pay the share, but VAT is not applied to the irrigation of water. The, these water use associations are progressively introducing qualified staff. It's a slow process. These are weak organizations, but yet they are involved in irrigation modernization programs, sometimes for more than 10 million euros. And, and this is something completely um, complex and, and uh, non-sustainable, right? Because you take an assembly of farmers who sit down around the table like this, and people who run their businesses at home, and maybe an electrical company, and maybe an industry, and, uh, and these people are managing 10 million euros, right? They have no capacities. So we need to uh, start thinking about changes in this area. If we look at the world, there are, there's plenty of variability. For instance, in, in Argentina, they, they talk about these inspecciones de causa, which is a similar figure uh, which are now supplying water to industries, to, to urban treatment plants, there's plenty of change going on in the world. In Chile, as you say, as you know, for 15, 20 years now, they have had a very liberal water law, the most liberal in the world, right? Which is, by the way, 
leading, leading to a complete failure of the water system in the north of Chile, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the law recognizes multiple water users and the law recognizes multiple water sources. Now, if you go to the north of Chile, you go to places like Copiapó or Antofagasta, the, the water rights that the government sold to private uh, interests are five times more, uh, imply five times more water than water there is. There is one unit of water, they sold five. The conflict is served, it's a, it's a, the clock is ticking, and, and it's going to happen, right? And, uh, and it's happening already, for instance, I, I, last year I visited this uh, copper mining industry, which had already bought water from the farmers, from the city, and was, uh, had built a desalination plant, and was pumping the water 80 kilometers, 500 meters, and was using water for the production of of uh, copper ore at the cost of three dollars a cubic meter. Three dollars a cubic meter. Now, the price of copper is going down quickly with the China crisis. Oh, it sounds like, like a music group from the 80s, my China crisis. So, um, and now, uh, what's going to happen with, with all these investments in water, right? Will they be able to sustain operation at this extra high water uh, price? Well, that, that's an interesting question. So, uh, but there are more, there is more to that. When we're talking about energy, there is not only uh, energy consumption for desalination, there is also energy production. Our farmers in, in the Water Use Association, some of them have um, hydropower plants, small ones, in canals, for instance. It's very common. One of these hydropower plants in a canal can um, produce energy for over 5,000 euros a day. And the farmers are in complete control of, of the discharge and, of course, in control of hydropower production. Mm -hmm. So this has proven very interesting uh, for the use of, uh, for the hiring of, of good professionals. This area in Spain, which, is, which has uh, it's an irrigated area, what we call a second degree. Mm -hmm. There are... 50 water users association and on top there's a second degree water users association. So they, they run some uh, six, seven hydropower companies. So they, they have uh, hired some 10 university degree persons in the technical staff of this executive board. So there are opportunities that can be exploited to have these professional capacities grow. The principles of irrigation governance, we uh, listed this, these principles together with, with Juan Antonio Sagardoy some, some 10 years ago, and we uh, discussed the relevance of transparency. These are very common management principles, not much new, right? Participation, very important to keep uh, the users involved and interesting, uh, participating in committing, for instance, um, may, taking advantage of this uh, effort of our chair, Professor Ahambi, the participatory irrigation management uh, um, discipline, which was actually born here at the Institute, traceability, which we have been promoting through databases for irrigation management, right? Where does every cubic meter of water that enters the Water Use Association go, right? We need to be uh, accountable for that, right? which then, uh, this traceability of water is what permits to differentiate the improvement in productivity or the improvement from the improvement of efficiency from the saving of water, which is a very complex target, which basically takes to uh, not cultivating. <laughs> it's the best, the best way to save water, right? <laughs> it's the way that we don't want to use anyway. Um, Effectiveness in, in benchmarking, in optimizing cost, monitoring and performance evaluation, which is rarely done in water use associations if there is not professional staff. Mm -hmm. Standardization is a very important issue uh, within the water use association. Standardized practices, standardized equipment, that is even more important in the international trade. Having all the equipment, the standards, so that they can, for instance, in terms of electronic, 
so that the different pieces of equipment can talk to each other. They are not isolated electronically, and they can communicate the data. And certification, and though we have been promoting, for instance, ISO 9000 in Water User Association in Spain, I don't know of any Water User Association that has actually done for that. And they have not done it, because they are not in the market. They don't need to get standardized, they don't need to get certified by ISO 9000 because the users cannot choose the water user association they get the water from. Right? So, in fact, they see little use. But the principles for ISO 9000 completely apply to water users association leadership, involvement of people, continual improvement. Look at this a factual approach to decision making. How important that is in water users associations. Well, an example which was actually discussed by Professor La Madalena, the, the, the history of, of irrigation in Spain in this century is a history of huge investments. We have um, applied modernization projects in over a million hectares in Spain and in investments which amount to about 10,000 euro a hectare. In many cases, that investment exceeds the price of the land. And this only covers the collective part. On top of it, farmers, me myself as a farmer, have to invest for the own farm equipment. But um, despite all this cost, which has been partially covered by the government, I don't know of any farmer who has been in a modernization project that would like to go back to the previous situation. So all of them are happy with different problems, right? So there has been public companies supporting the Water Use Association in the executive function, because many of them did not have the capacities to do it. But we need, uh, we still need to have a performance evaluation campaign. We have research data uh, showing precisely what was discussed before, that we have improved many things, particularly uh, the productivity, um, the, the labor conditions, we have favored the entrepreneurship of the farmers. Um, our rivers are cleaner now, that, that is a fact also. Uh, we have intensified production and we believe that that is sustainable uh, intensification that needs a proper evaluation. Have we saved water? Um, it's a nice day today, right, isn't it? It's sunny and what was the question anyway? <laughs> no, we have not saved any water. How could we? Um, and we have a drastic increase in the energy needs. But we hope to be able to, uh, to do some research on that. But we now have data, right? We have data on, for instance, on the left, on the volume of irrigation, irrigating on water. You can see here 6,000 hectares. And we have data on efficiency on the right of the figure. Mm -hmm. So we know who is efficient, who is not, who needs to improve, right? Um, and we have done this through databases, through management. Through, um, through traceability, basically. But this kind of research is the fruit of, uh, this kind of study is the fruit of our research efforts, while it should be the fruit of a standard um, quality control studies for the irrigation modernization. It should be an ex post evaluation. And, uh, well, we conclude my talk with, with the discussion of a few trends that we can see in governance in the last decades. One of them is that the public system is contracting, right? And we are leaving more room for the farmers' organizations in the management. We have seen this through massive water transfer, water management transfer programs, for instance, in Latin America, promoted by international agencies. We are seeing this through intense private operations which have been called in the press land grabbing or water grabbing or speculation of crops. I mean, there are many variants on it. Some of them seem more adequate or fair or sound than others. But, but this is clear and is somehow part of the maturity process of the irrigation process. And in this figure, I would like to discuss the difference between the ownership and the management of the structures, right? So in these circles, we have the different parts of the irrigated area or, or the, of a large irrigation project, right? From the general purpose, large waterworks, 
which are public in nature, in property. Then there are rural large canals, for instance, that are uh, public in property, in Spain, of course. Then we have the collective part, which is the infrastructure, maybe a reservoir, a pressurized network, to the hydrant. The hydrant is a, is a very important point, because that is the interface, public-private. It's, it's a physical apparatus, a physical device, but in fact it represents the dialogue between the private and the collective. It's a very important part of the, of the sector. And then private property, uh, private property on the on-farm systems. But this is quite clear in the ownership. There are some exceptions. For instance, in order to fool the European Commission <laughs> and to apply subsidies to agriculture, some of these collective works are the property of the government of Spain. But they are, um, through an agreement, through a memorandum of understanding, they are and will be managed by the users forever and ever. But they remain the property. That was to avoid state aid policies. Because if the government builds an infrastructure and gives them to the farmers, that is a state aid. Yes. And, and the European Commission is against that. So uh, there are always ups and downs. For the management, there are more possibilities. In general, the government will run all the common infrastructure, the, the general purpose and the rural. But very increasingly, the government gives away the management to farmers if they are ready for, for it. And if these structures, these canals, do only imply one use, which is the use of the Water User Association. As far as there are different competing uses, the government stays on the management, right? And then the management of collective, of course, is in the hands of the Water Use Association, but in some cases, the Water Use Associations are managing the private systems. That's a very interesting situation, right? The Water Use Association is using technology to irrigate all the farms, and the farmers only adjust the schedule applied and, and executed by the Water Use Association. That is a very interesting uh, situation which actually permits to exploit the electric tariffs very well because the Water Use Association will irrigate when the energy is cheaper or when there is water in the reservoir. I mean, there are many possibilities. Another trend that we have been observing is the empowerment of farmers and their organizations. That's a very important issue too, uh, which encompasses the growth in the technical capacities of the Water Use Associations and helps the social perception of the importance of agriculture. And, and this empowerment, which has been observed in many places, allows farmers to develop the directive function um, and to run the cycle of strategic decision making. And we've seen examples of farmers uh, running diagnostic analysis, planning, and managing the, uh, the improvement of the irrigated areas. We are happy that this is happening. Then we have seen more and more private companies in different situations. Sometimes the government's plan for the private companies to support the management improvement program for a few years, typically 10 years, right? And then they disappear, that's the way it should be at least. And uh, the cooperation between the government and the private companies and the farmers has led to significant successes. Then we have seen plenty of private irrigation developments. Uh, yeah, I have been consulting for developments of an amazing magnitude with debatable results uh, that go between, between the creation of wealth and land grabbing. These projects are usually moving between both extremes. There are ups and downs. Huh? Um, <coughs> More than 75% of the irrigated area in Latin America has been directly developed by the private sector, which may create a conflict then with the fact that water is a public good and should be regulated by the government. So uh, in Africa, well, uh, we have seen many operations which are now under scrutiny and, and which should be watched out because they are often linked to speculation. This is uh, probably the last idea that I want to spread. The fact that many of the circumstances today of the water use associations are um, limiting 
uh, progress. And that is the case, for instance, of the historical boundaries of the irrigated areas. Um, we can no longer maintain these historical boundaries. We need to perform large-scale rural planning before doing modernization. Right? Before modernizing an area of 1,000 hectares, we need to look out at the full project of 100,000 areas in all hectares in order to harmonize, in order to optimize, particularly with a view to energy. Look at this project. It's, it's located in Spain, and the figure on the left with the different colors are all the different water users associations. Now, if you irrigate a project like that, you will end up with 13 reservoirs, and the energy cost of the pool area will be 1.5 million euro a year. Now, if you change the boundaries and you go to this situation where you only have uh, three different areas and you take advantage of, uh, advantage of natural pressure, then you will be having only three reservoirs and there will be no energy cost. Now, the difference of this 1.5 million euro is the sustainability of the area and we cannot afford to keep up with history. History is very expensive to manage. So we need to introduce more flexibility in the boundaries and in the management and in the uh, capacities of these implicated areas. Um, and we need to introduce, in the terms of reference of these irrigated areas, uh, the mandate to uh, minimize the operational costs. They have to statutorily be mandated to optimize the cost, minimize the cost, the possibility to aggregate irrigated areas and change the boundaries, and reinforce the public side, because the water user associations need to have the capacity to defend the public interest of irrigation modernization. I want to finish uh, the discussion, and I'm sorry that I'm taking a couple more time, minutes than, than you, uh, by, uh, by spreading the voice that uh, on the European side, the new release, which is already beginning to be operational, of the rural development funds links rural development to uh, innovation and we all have a role to play in, in these projects for rural development and there will be funds from the European Union associated to the funds of the regions of our countries to spread innovation and water is a critical issue in this rural development plan, in the planning of the European Union. Mm -hmm. So water in agriculture, efficiency, water quality, are issues that require cooperation between the academia represented today and the companies and the water user associations to shape up the European farming for sector for the years to come. And this Congress is actually a good opportunity to discuss innovation that can actually turn into innovation projects for the coming years. Take home messages, new governance models, we need to reshape our water user associations. We can uh, improve performance to infrastructure and governance, but infrastructure is way more expensive than governance. Only problem is that governance progresses very slowly, because it progresses at the speed of human resources. We need young professionals, so it's good to say this words here at the Institute, where so many young professionals are trained every year, because we need them in order to execute uh, these, uh, these technical uh, measures for the performance of the irrigated area. And um, this is all. I, I hope we have the opportunity to, to see additional, these additional communications on governance with enlightening ideas for the future of the Water Use Association. Thank you very much, Professor Bertrand, for this very interesting, really, uh, presentation with a very clear one, and you give us an information about the keys in speed. The Professor Bertrand, in fact, started speaking about <coughs> directed and executive uh, functions in the beginning of his uh, speech. Then after that, he started speaking about the models of uh, irrigation uh, governance. And he stressed on water user association, public administration, cooperative organization, local entities, and the private companies, and he stressed 
much more on the modernization. The question is, are these models working together? Are these Cinderella bringing them and it's one, one will succeed till now in governing our water resources? Can correct me, Dr. Pasquale, if, if you all report the same that, that on, on farm water needs efficiency is only 50%, and if 50% of the water is lost and doesn't arrive to the tanks, this means that we are not able to now to gather our water resources. Are these principles, are, are these models working together in our way? Yes or no, that is the point. Then Professor also speak about the principles that actually we have to speak of us. The key what we have said transparency, pa pa pa, to the place of course, are not implemented, are not implemented. And therefore we are not, and therefore we are, we are not able to govern our water resources. Then after that you say that we need a, a, some specialists to start to work in that. The, the point is that these specialists are not retrained, the capacity building is very weak. So we have to increase the capacity building in this field if we want to govern our water resources. These are really major topics that we have to take care of it in all our programs. Professor, thank you very much for your presentation and I open the floor if there is are any questions from the professor. Thank you very much. Yes, Professor Pascal. Well, no, simply is along this line you were saying so, so you can come here and put the microphone. Along this line, uh, toward the end you were uh, indicating that the infrastructure, in fact, is fast, costly, risky, but visible, and governance is uh, slow, but cost-effective. Now, we have, we agree on the principle of that, but like has been said, we have found a lot of problems to implement. Still, in developing countries at least, governments that are effective in, in improving the reform. It, because the human factor, because it's so more complex, basically, exactly, so it's more related to the human the capacity, the performance, and so on, the level of instruction. And you, in fact, uh, rightly mentioned the young professional. We are trying to play on that, on that role, trying to bring into the sector new, let's say, energies, especially with young. How do you see, essentially, this uh, slow pace of, of, you know, implementing the governance in the right way? What, what are the limiting factors? Where we, do you think, in your experience, we should act more in order to accelerate this process, which we all believe is very, very important? Well, no, but that, that is the key of the issue because, in fact, see, if you are building infrastructure, you build it, you go, and then it continues to degrade, and FAO and the World Bank has, has seen this, this situation happening very often. I'm, I'm discussing a project in, in Southern Africa these days with the World Bank, and the, it's a re-intervention, re-intervention in 20 years' time. Why did it fail? Technically, everything was correct. It was, it was the governance, it was the human factor. Right? Um, the human factor progresses. I remember as a young student trying to study in, in, in the US, I took my first plane to go to the US, those were the days. And, um, and I was shocked that farmers were aware of the volume of water they were using in the States. But in Spain, they were not. But now they are. It's been 25 years. Uh, Spain being a developed country um, uh, makes things easier. But it is not probably as much the fact of, of the training or, or, the, or, or the capacities in society as it is the problem of water scarcity. See, when, when the pressure on water resources increases, um, farmer society needs to develop new skills. Probably we are not at the higher level of governance, transmitting the pressure correctly to the to the farmers, to the users. Sometimes the government, the governments, they, uh, willingly or unwillingly buffer the pressure. Right? They keep the pressure. They don't let it go. 
um, they are afraid of, of the rural well-being. They are afraid of the rural votes, right? Uh, and, uh, and pressure helps. Now, for training, as for instance, as, as we were discussing in this particular project with the World Bank, it, it is not the formal academic training. See? In Europe, we know it very well. In, in the oldest university in Europe, in Bologna, we started a, a joint project to, to to change the system of university lecturing upside down to make it more hands-on, more applied. And that was 10 years ago. My, my older brother, son, has started the university on Monday, last Monday. And he was told that the process is not yet implemented, which means this is going to take 10 more years, right? So then again, because of the speed of progress of human resources, right? But definitely it's worth uh, trying. And, and in the projects I've seen around the world, and maybe we could share this experience now, change is being made. And, and I, I think we, we should not be pessimistic that we cannot afford to be pessimistic either. Right? Because we need to make sure that we are agents of change here today in the room. So we need to start pushing. Construction will happen. Because when you start a bid for a hundred million dollars, companies will show up. Yeah. Construction will happen. But how beneficial is that? This project that I'm mentioning with, with the World Bank has roughly between five and ten percent assigned to training to capacity building in different ways. So that is already a sign of belief. The problem is that the project will last for five years and capacity building needs to continue. We cannot let go. So, uh, but I, don't, I didn't give you any answer, that's why I'm a professor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Thank you very much, Professor Riali, for being with us today.